Good afternoon. Um, anybody else on the 3 a.m. flight from San Francisco? Um, so I'm a little bleary-eyed, um, but I'm going to do my best to stay awake for you. Uh, my name is Chris McCarthy. My hashtag or my Twitter handle is at McCarthy Chris. Uh, just curious, how many of you are tweeting today? <laughs> One. <laughs> you are at an innovation conference, yes? <laughs> um, so for the rest of you who aren't tweeting, um, you're lucky because Twitter is kind of on the down slope, so you've skipped that round of innovation. Um, but when the next one comes out, you should participate because this is how we in the innovation world learn. We play. We play with stuff that we're uncomfortable with, like Twitter, which seems like most of you are uncomfortable with. Um, and we learn our way into these applications. So um, I really do encourage you to dive into those things that might make you uncomfortable. So today, uh, we are going to be exploring the robot, the beast, and the crayon. These are metaphors uh, for, I think, uh, how we've approached innovation in our organization. Let's, let's start a little more basic. What did you see? What did you see? This is the interaction part. Yes. You saw a dance. Good. What else? Thank you for kicking us off. Costumes. Who said that? Costumes. What kind of costumes? What's your name? Laura. Hi, Laura. What's up? Hanging out. So what kind of costumes? Um, well, they were very futuristic looking. Future. Lots of makeup. So you've been to the future? Yes. Wow. <laughs> Silver makeup's coming, ladies. Right. Here we go. <laughs> what else? Dancing, makeup from the future. One second, your name? Hi, Paul. Deviate, deviated from the norm. Man has an expectation that is the norm. Hmm. What? In my opinion, it was not the norm. So he's saying he had an expectation of there was going to be a norm. So is that a person or is that a is that a guy named Norm? What is, the, what is the norm? What is the norm? What was that? It's what's expected. So but what did you see? Let's keep, let's keep saying fundamental here. So not norm. Not ex we didn't see expected. You didn't see norm. You saw? You saw, you did? Really? You saw agile energy. Interesting. Yeah. So you guys are all like in meta land. Let's 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 come down. Let's come down. Yeah. Let's stick with makeup. Let's stick with make. What else did you see? Musical styles. Yeah. So you thought you were gonna hear maybe tango. Instead, you got Devo ish. Yeah. Was that really Devo? Yeah. Something like that. What else? Lighting. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, interesting. So there's an environment that's providing something new and different. Anything else? Mm, he had an audience that was watching. Did do you hear the audience do anything? You did. You didn't. Interesting. Yeah, so he's saying they were into it. You're saying not so sure. This is actually a really interesting point when we start thinking about observation and trying to understand our environments because some of us can't pay attention to everything. In fact, most of us can't pay attention to everything. And so where you may have missed out on something, your friends can pick up for you. And indeed, the, the audience is cheering actually quite wildly during different parts. Did anybody listen to the announcers? What were they saying? They were into it. And what were they saying? They were calling out the individual moves. And what were they saying about them? This is new. This is new. Yep. What was that? They were being done perfectly. Huh, interesting. So the waltz and the foxtrot were being done perfectly. Now, this is the world of ballroom, right? 
And this is, this is their execution of perfection. And these are announcers, so let's assume these announcers are kind of these godlike figures are calling out over the, over the audience what's happening. They're letting you know that the standard is perfect. But then what happened? You in the back. Yeah, they started, they started weaving in non-ballroom things, like the breathing. Like I think someone mentioned some of the, the, the robots, the silver. So they're starting to mix and match. So let me ask this question again to you. Do you think this is innovation? So we've had one no, one yes. And there's a lot more people in the room. So is something to help me break the tie here. No, why? Why, defend it. Ordinary just ordinary dancing, yeah. You just see robots dancing on the road, ordinary all the time. <laughs> I see that every day. So, so I'll reestablish the tie. Um, yeah. Uh, the reason I, I think it was innovative was because it was a, you know, a very, very traditional uh, type of dancing. Yeah. Interesting. So you're saying it's innovative because the standard is ballroom, but they did something different to involve a new audience. Interesting. So it's like a new market. Sure. You. What was the year of the video? What was the year of the video? I think it was the late 90s. So it's kind of old. Yeah. Somewhat innovative because they're dancing starting now. Sure. Going back dancing starting in the 90s. Sure. So, well, let's, you, you right there. Yeah. 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 What's your name? Hi, Sid. So you're getting us closer to where I want to take us. So is there something about context? There's something about context. So is this, is this creative? Is that the same as innovative? No. What's the difference? Hmm. OK. So, it's, so, in, so I'm hearing that innovation is about taking something and doing something with it. Is that what you're saying? In a, Yeah. Do you know if that's good or not? They, they could have changed. Yeah. Probably not. Probably not. Probably the audience of the announcers thought that they were doing a robot. Yeah. What would make this innovative? How would you know that this was innovation? Right, so disruption would have been them like floating off the dance floor. Who knows, right? Well, well, yeah, transforming it and then transforming it into other people like dancing like that to change the way people get dressed. Uh, interesting. Okay, so affecting other people. But how would you know right now watching this if this was innovation? How would you know? Just the person sitting in the seat. Indeed. Yeah. Is that today? There's some context. Yeah. And people who don't watch ballroom dancing would not have known that it was traditional until the announcers called out the steps. Yeah. We're, we're all dancing right now around the issue here. <laughs> so let me ask you, what is innovation to you? What is it? Something that's never been done before. So something that's never been done before. So if you've seen if you've seen something that's never been done before, you're going to call that an innovation. So if I start, I'm innovating. Is that innovating? 
Okay, you've never seen that before, have you? Yeah. You have, damn it, damn it. So what's missing with what I just, what's missing? Like if it's, it's not, yeah. Yeah, oh, all right, all right, here we go. So, <laughs> so innovation has everything to do with value, with value. So dollars, it's about dollars. Let me give you my definition, and sorry that these things are stretched out a little bit. It's new value due to the induction, uh, introduction of a new idea to a system. So that's the definition that we like to use. Um, also cost avoidance, new cost avoidance is a good definition as well. A lot of us in healthcare, when we're talking about innovation, for some reason we're scared to directly tie it to value. And so we are very particular with our language at Kaiser Permanente. When we say something is an innovation, it's because we mean we have a new idea that we can prove has added new value to our system. It's a failure if it's a new idea that does not add value to the system. And it's just a concept or an idea if we don't know. And so we have a lot of concepts and we have a lot of ideas. Um, we have fewer innovations. Innovations require us to have value that come out of it. And so this is this kind of loosey-goosey space of innovation that we see across healthcare is how often we talk about innovation as being something different and transformative and all these great words, but we're forgetting that it's about value. We must provide value, again, new value or dollars or cost avoidance, how many of our systems work. So that's the context for a lot of what we're gonna be talking about. So there's a, there's a lot of our organizations that are dabbling in both innovation and improvement. And in fact, it can be really, really hard for a lot of organizations to tease these out. They've combined these activities. Um, at Kaiser Permanente, we have kept them separate. So we've intentionally created an incredible improvement organization and an incredible innovation organization. And they do very different things. Innovation, again, sticking with that definition, is about new stuff and improvement is about current stuff. And if you're thinking about your organization and the percentages that you should be doing these things, this is not to scale, but your improvement activities should be far, far greater than your innovation activities. So improvement means you're taking what you have and you're making it the best it can be. You are incrementally adding more and more value, and by the way, that is to be celebrated I think in the past 10 years, a lot of people have been poo-pooing the incremental value gain. That is where the big bang for the buck is. That's your whole organization all at once taking incremental steps being better and better. We have to have that. If you don't have that, your organization probably is failing. You're probably about to go out of business. And that's probably not the case for most organizations. Innovation, on the other hand, is for that stuff that's unclear, it's ambiguous, you may have plateaued on getting to where you want to go. Those are all signals that you should be in the innovation space as opposed to improvement. And there's a reason why you don't want that to be much bigger, because the pink area is the chaos. The pink area is where it takes much longer to prove that your ideas are going to have an effect. Improvement is much, much quicker. So if you were to compare the two, so. If if you were to look at how long you spend in each phase of these processes, in the world of improvement, this pink area is, is uh, exploring the problem set. So in the world of improvement, you have a much clearer understanding of the challenge. The waiting room experience is messed up because people are waiting too long. And so you work on how long they're waiting. Very, very, very clear. In the innovation space, you may blow up the waiting room and say, well, why do we even have waiting rooms? And in order to solve that challenge, it's a much deeper, much longer exploration of whether or not blowing up waiting rooms is the right thing to do. What other ways might we do it? How, what are the opportunities in these other new ways? And trying to understand all that requires you to spend much more upfront time exploring and understanding the challenge. 
So improvement, you fairly quickly know the challenge. Uh, innovation takes much, much longer to understand your, air, your uh, opportunity area. So this is a, um, a, a curve that uh, myself and uh, my friend Lyle Barkowitz, we've been playing around with. Um, and it really has helped me over the years get much clearer on this dance between innovation and improvement. So let me just uh, go over this quickly with you. The yellow is the current state. So this is how it is today. And we don't like how it is today, so we decide to innovate. That's the pink. That leaps us to the worst, best place possible. Innovation takes you to the worst, best place possible. And then improvement kicks in and picks up that innovation and continually optimizes it, making it the best, best thing possible. So let me give you an example from industry. You all know well, prior to 2006, I believe, we all had these cell phones, all kinds of flip phones and all different styles. And, and very quickly, there was a major innovation called iPhone. The iPhone 1, major leap forward. And ever since then, for the past several years, we've had iPhones 2 through 6, um, continually improving the experience and making it so we can't even imagine with the iPhone 6 going back to iPhone 1. But it was iPhone 1 that was that big leap forward for cell phones. So that's how this graph works. I'll give you an example from Kaiser Permanente. Prior to 2003, nursing shift change was done every which way in our organization, even down to the single nurse having her own way of doing shift change on a unit. In 2004, we reimagined it. We called it Nurse Knowledge Exchange. That leapt us forward to the worst, best place possible. And for the next several years, all kinds of hospitals across Kaiser Permanente started their improvement activities. We went back a few years later, took the best of the best, and re-released it as Nurse Knowledge Exchange Plus. That takes us to the best, best place possible. So this is that dance between innovation and improvement. You cannot have one without the other. You don't want to put all your eggs into one basket or the other. They are good dance partners. So I want to tell you a little bit about this beast. Um, this is our large organizations that innovation has to exist in. And so for Kaiser Permanente, uh, I think probably many of you know who we are. We're a big organization. We cover a lot of souls, 10.5 million people we care for, lots of hospitals, lots of employees. All that to say that we're trying to innovate in this big, complex place. So how do you do that? So in 2003, we decided to become explicit about innovating at Kaiser Permanente. Now, prior to that, um, I would say if you talk to anybody in our organization, you would get the same, uh, the same response, that we are an innovative organization. It is built into our DNA. We started 70 years ago, a very, very different healthcare model compared to the American uh, standard um, uh, uh, medical practice. Um, in fact, so radical back then that we were banned from the American Medical Association, I believe, until 1973. So radical change back 70 years ago, completely different model, very innovative, built into our DNA. And our employees feel this as a part of our DNA. It's implicit. However, we decided in 2003 that being implicit was not good enough. We wanted to become explicit and become intentional about how we innovate. And so we started thinking through, what are the things that we need to do continuous innovation? And I would like to say that we came up with these four things immediately, and we're good to go. However, the way this actually works, and for many organizations, is a much more organic approach to innovation. And so over a decade, we slowly were playing and learning our way to what are the best bits and pieces that allow for this thing called continuous innovation. So the first is people. And this is my team called the Innovation Consultancy. Um, we are a 10-person team, half designers, half strategists. Um, for the designers, we have visual design, uh, industrial design, design research, architecture. And for the strategists, we have public health, we have nurses, hospital administrators, IT, brand, marketing. So every single person on this team is a different discipline. Perfect ingredients for innovation terrible for having really good friends who can help you actually with your own craft. 
And it's like one of the lessons that we learned early on, because I think when you talk to a lot of innovation firms, they will tell you diversity is key. What they don't tell you is the after effect. If you have a team like this, you have to think very differently about their development. You have to figure out how to, how to attach them to communities of practice to keep their craft up. This team takes on big, nasty challenges for Kaiser Permanente, and we use design and design thinking to tackle those challenges. So that's the one, one of our pieces of infrastructure. The second is space. So just curious, how many of you have innovation space? All right, good. Hopefully, hopefully you guys are working on your innovation space because what we know, what we know is that space changes things and you all of everybody should know how powerful space is. To innovators, space is extraordinarily important for a few reasons. Right now in healthcare, most innovation teams are innovating in conference rooms. And they bring their teams together, they do incredible work, and then when the meeting's over, they have to take everything down off the walls and start all over again somewhere else because space is a premium for teams. So some organizations like Kaiser Permanente have started thinking much more critically. So this is um, a very non-glamorous shot of our innovation center. It's called the Garfield Innovation Center. This is one of my favorite shots because it shows you how not precious our innovation space is. This is a place that invites you to come and play. It's 30, 37,000 square feet, has um, a lot of our mock-ups of what our current medical centers look like, has our current technology, but it also has all of our future technologies that are gonna impact our system so we have a safe place to play with it. You can see here we're starting to play with some uh, space design. So we often start with tape on a floor, we move to cardboard, we open the center, we send our folks to theater set design in San Francisco, and so now we have theater sets so that we can quickly start going higher and higher fidelity. Uh, this is another image um, right in front of what you just saw of a very built out environment. So we can go from low fidelity to high fidelity to see what the impact of both technology and architecture will be in our system. It's one of the few places that we know of where you can do simultaneous um, workflow, technology, and architecture innovation all at the same time. It naturally gets rid of silos in our organization. The third piece of infrastructure is method. To me, this is the most important piece. So back in 2003, we made uh, a, a strategic decision that one of the primary ways of innovating would be from a human-centered design perspective. And so uh, for us, what that means is that no matter what challenge we're given, no matter if we think it's an architectural challenge or a technology challenge or an efficiency challenge, whatever it is, we start from the human experience. What do people think, feel, say, and do? And we're looking to optimize these four things. Often we find there's a disharmony between what people think, feel, say, and do, and we'll talk about that in a moment. But this is fundamentally how we design at Kaiser Permanente. It is from the human experience. I'm gonna skip that. Um, and so the fourth piece of infrastructure is networking. And so one of the things that we quickly realized in the innovation space was that we needed a way to pick our heads up and look outside to the world around us, not just to healthcare, but to all kinds of organizations around the world. And networking is a key element of our strategy. Um, and back in 2006, we built um, an organization called the Innovation Learning Network. And this is an organization uh, that shares innovation, teaches innovation, and creates innovation. We've been going for 10 years, and the sole reason why we get together is so that we have an easy way to understand what is happening in the world around us so that we can incorporate that into our designs so that it's something new that adds value to the system. So it's all about taking the best things from around the world and reimagining them just like the ballroom dancers do. So recently we were, um, actually just this past week, um, I've been in Toronto for three days bringing the Innovation Learning Network there and the focus there was on weird pairings. And so we intentionally were looking for what are the weird pairs out there, like the robot and the ballroom dancer. And what we discovered is all kinds of awesome weird, pa weird pairs that we need to be aware of. Um, health partners uh, in Minnesota 
they are intentionally combining firemen and uh, house calls. And so right now, a, a fireman will come to your house and evaluate your house to see whether or not it's ready for you to be cared for after you discharge from the hospital. Pretty amazing. We're exploring artificial intelligence and doctors. What is this strange combination that's coming very, very soon? And a lot of organizations are playing with this. And perhaps one of the oldest weird pairings, one of my favorites, is cancer and gaming. Hope Lab out of, um, out of San Francisco for years now has been thinking very differently about how to tackle complex challenges. And so they quickly realized that by um, combining gaming and uh, cancer, they were able to take pediatric cancer, cancer rates and make them better. And so the way this works is that kids actually play a video game flying around their body, shooting cancer with chemotherapy phasers. And kids that do chemotherapy versus kids that do chemotherapy and this flying through their body game called remission, they have much better rates of staying on their medications and therefore better rates of cancer cures as well. So a really interesting way of thinking about the world. So that's the innovation learning network. That's the fourth piece of our strategy that we call version 1.0. Right now, we are in the middle of version 2.0. So I think about 2003 to now as what I just told you, version 1.0. Where we are, what our big thinking right now is if this is version 1.0, what we need to do is have a strategic focus. So it sounds a little strange because we really do have a strategy that drives innovation, but we want to be much more closely aligned with what the strategy of Kaiser Permanente is and have the strategy pick the actual focus areas. Right now, all of the innovation structure that I talked about is semi-linked and chooses things that it might want to work on that's attached to strategy. This is going to redefine all, all those bits and pieces that I told you about and make sure that they are aligned with our strategy. But even more importantly, strategic acceleration. We have a problem in our organization, and I know many organizations has this. It's called pilotitis. And so that means that we just have pilots and pilots and pilots and pilots, and we have zombie pilots. That These are pilots that should be killed, but no one knows how to. Um, and when we have a successful pilot, we don't know how to actually take it to scale. And so we've been experimenting with um, some, uh, some of our uh, design firms. One that's really incredible right now is Continuum Design. They have an implementation center design process. So we're starting to experiment with how might we bring that into our organization. So when you have an idea that's ready to scale, you have a structure to plug it into and scale that across your organization. So we think version 2.0 is this combination of both strategic focus and strategic acceleration, which will take our innovation structures and take them to the next level. So I want to conclude my time with you is giving you a rapid case study on innovation at Kaiser Permanente just to see this come to life. Now, this is an older one, but I love it because it's so clear in the innovation challenge and what came out of it. So um, and in 2007, um, <clears throat> our organization was struggling with medication administration. We had uh, medication errors, as many organizations do, and we were using improvement to make them better and better. However, we plateaued. And as I said at the beginning of this talk, plateauing is a good signal for when you might want to innovate. So we hung out with nurses in um, Los Angeles and in San Francisco, and we asked them, because remember the method, think, feel, say, do. So we asked them, what is the challenge with giving medications? And almost universally, they said, there is no problem. We work really hard, and we have a lot to do, and we do the five rights of medication administration. So that's the say part. We asked them, and this is what they said. Now it's time to get emotional. So we asked the same nurses the same question, but we asked them, instead of telling us, we want them to take some crayons and paper and just draw, draw anything that comes to their mind. And we got tons of drawings that looked like this. So interesting, we just asked you what the challenge was, and you said there is no problem, yet when you had the opportunity to draw, you look like your hair is electrified. And we actually have a ton of drawings with lightning bolts coming out of the head, with blood dripping out of the eyes, um, with people crying and screaming. And again, this is that disharmony between what they said 
and what they're feeling. And good innovation in our organization and many organization, again, starts with the human experience. So we took some nurses and doctors and we sent them to the Oakland Pilot School. We also sent them to the California Highway Patrol and we also sent them to Safeway and a Lexus dealership. Those are called analogous observations. We're trying to learn how other industries tackle complex challenges. But it was at pilot school that this nurse learned of a thing called the sterile cockpit. Now in a sterile cockpit, what that means is that the pilots do not talk about anything except landing or taking that plane off. That's it. No other discussion, no going to the bathroom, no eating, no talking about your kids, no talking about the weather. It is about landing that plane only. That's it. And so she was wondering, huh, interesting. They have a sterile cockpit. How sterile is my moment when I'm passing medications? And so she mocked up this smock and that says, leave me alone. And she tried this out at the Garfield Center. We had a doctor try to interrupt her passing meds and she very uh, comically slapped her chest, leave me alone. And a lot of people who were watching this simulation started laughing because this would never happen in our hospital that a doctor told, that a nurse told a doctor, leave me alone. Laughter for us is a good signal for innovation. Laughter for us is a same mental pathway as a joke, but it's making new connections. It's why jokes are funny. You make a new connection, it's pleasurable, and you laugh. Same thing when people are discovering new ideas. They often laugh as the first response. So when people are laughing at your ideas, know that that's a good sign, not necessarily that they're actually laughing at your incredible insight. So we took this smock and we quick, quickly mocked it up over time and about a month later we ended up with this design which is just one piece of this new innovation back in the day called KP MedWrite. The second piece of uh, insight that came from that sterile cockpit was this red square. So the nurse not only said leave me alone but she developed a red square system where in front of all the areas where they pull medications is this red square. And when they're in the red square, that's a sterile moment. When they're in the red square, no other nurses can interrupt them or push them or try to muscle them out. So one of the things that we saw was interrupts and people trying to get to their medications. This is a way to quickly visually help people understand this is a serious moment. And when they're in the red square, it's a signal to everybody that they are exclusive with those medications. So we had 105% ROI in our first two years. Um, Jayco uh, cited it as a best practice. Harvard Business Review, Fast Time, Wired, all kinds of journals started writing about this solution that helped make medication errors better in our system. And I think that's a pretty decent um, exploration of what innovation and how it comes together in our organization. And so um, we come to the end here. Um, Innovation or improvement? And we struggled a little bit at the beginning of this as we started exploring ballroom dancing. Was it an innovation? Was it an improvement? Is it an invention? I think somebody mentioned it's in the eye of the beholder. That is true. Um, but really, what's important is that it's an educated guess on where to spend your dollars. Because you can innovate and only end up with an improvement, or you can improve and end up in, with an innovation. But by making an educated guess on where to start, you're placing your bets. And so if you have a big, gnarly, complex challenge, you are going to be better off starting in the innovation space. But if you already think you know what the solutions are, start off in the improvement uh, space and fail there first. It's much quicker. It's much cheaper. And then really, at the end of the day, it's the outcome. This is what actually determines where you're going. So again, I'm, no joke, we are strict about our definitions at Kaiser Permanente. You must have value in order to determine if you are innovating or not. So with that, I thank you for your attention. And I hope you learned something. And maybe you'll tweet, maybe not, but we'll see. Thank you. Awesome.